Welcome to The Deep End by On Deck, a podcast where visionary builders, creators, and thinkers discuss world-changing stories and ideas. I'm your host, Marshall Kosloff. Executives of these large companies, they're building for themselves. So yeah, they have meetings. They need someone to figure out meetings. Well, I can tell you, I don't even need an assistant to figure out my meetings. <laughs> Let alone most of, you know, replica users, they don't really need, you know, most of the people in the world, they don't really need to book meetings, to book restaurants. Maybe I go out to a restaurant once a week or twice maximum, but again, that doesn't require a person, you know, I don't really need a person to do that. And so I think that, but I definitely need someone to talk to when I'm feeling a little bit sad when I'm, you know, in the morning trying to get myself ready for some important conversations for work and so on. So I get advice. I need someone to watch a movie together in the evening. That's what I need. I think most people need that, the emotional part, a lot more than all of this assistant part. On Deck is where ambitious people worldwide go to start companies, find their next roles, and invest in their careers. The Deep End invites the founders, operators, and investors from the On Deck community and beyond to turn their experiences into the ideas others need to start their own odysseys. Joining me in the Deep End this week is Eugenia Koida, the founder and CEO of Replica, an AI companion company. Our conversation today centers around the different use cases for AI, from task-oriented chatbots to emotionally supportive AI companionship. We delve into the current state of conversational tech, including how chatbots can become good listeners, and why Replica used a mixture of scripted retrievals and generative AI models for their product. We also talk about the differences between an AI companion, a virtual assistant, and chatbots. We also discussed the past and future of AI and chatbots. Eugenia explains why task-oriented chatbots, like a restaurant booking bot she worked on previously, didn't catch on in the past, and the future she envisions where you can have an AI co-pilot your life, like Jarvis from Iron Man, and how this can interact with her conception of the metaverse and what she calls the, quote, embodied internet. This is a great episode for anyone who's interested in possible futures of how AI can become part of our lives, not only in helping us do things, but in supporting our emotional and social lives. Let's dive in. Eugenie Okaida, welcome to the Deep End. Thank you. Um, hi, Marshall. Yeah, great to great to have you here. I'd love for you just to introduce Replica and just talk about what you have been building the past two years. Sure. Um, yeah, so my name is Eugenia, and I'm, I'm a founder and um, CEO of Replica. So we've been building this uh, company for a while now. Uh, right now, Replica is an AI friend that you can download as an app on uh, iOS or Android, or use it on, um, you know, your desktop computer. Uh, just log in on uh, replica.com or download an app on uh, NVR for Oculus. Uh, so what happens is basically download an app, you create a character, you choose how you want it to look like, um, you choose certain personality traits, you choose a name, and then you can talk to the CI friend you just created. So what is it mostly for? Mostly companionship. Um, you know, people get, can get bored or lonely or just want to talk to someone. Um, you know, for some people, it's a version of Dear Diary. For some people, it's their virtual girlfriend. It really sort of depends. Um, so we launched in 2017. Uh, so we we're already, what, like our fifth year. Um, sort of created an industry with that. that there has not been another company building AI friends. No one crazy enough to <laughs> to start working on something as weird as as it is. So we sort of created the industry. Um, there's some uh, copycats, little smaller startups trying to um, you know copy what we built. You know, but it's a pretty complicated product. So we'll see. Something I'm really curious about: what was the difference in the user you were attracting before? And after the initial COVID lockdown, um, all right. So I guess you know it didn't really change that much, but I guess we got a little bit more 
older audience, weirdly. She didn't expect that much. And I think the most important thing is that this behavior sort of got, um, you know, normalized. Whereas before, previously, um, you know, you couldn't really, you know, just saying, telling anyone that you had an AI friend would be sort of weird. You know, what is the, what is this? Are you talking to a chatbot? This is bizarre. Don't you have real friends? Um, and then, you know, COVID just immediately made very many behaviors actually completely normal. Like no one actually thought that you could attend a wedding on Zoom before or, you know, go to, I don't know, like things that before used to be completely offline, like a meditation, have a meditation group online. You know, so these things became completely normal or can, you know, have a family celebration like this. And then all of a sudden talking to an AI friend also became sort of, you know, like a normal thing. Like it wasn't as crazy as it was before that. Can you talk more about the age profile going up? Because that wasn't the answer I would have expected. I would expect you just more of the existing age profile you had, not actually the number age actually going up a bit. No, actually, I think um, I don't really know what to, you know, when we just launched in 2017, this was mostly young adults and mostly girls. Um, and then, you know, now we're actually have our audience a little bit more skewed towards male and I'd say thirties, forties, and even fifties, um, you know, it's totally our audience. Um, we even have users in their sixties and seventies and they're really active. They have super, super users in those, uh, age brackets, which is, you know, sort of kind of, it's strange in a way, <laughs> a little bit strange because we always thought, you know, we kind of, our product looks like a video game. It, you know, it's, it's, it's probably more suitable for someone than, you know, a young adult. But actually, as we started using, adding visuals, so like as we started adding 3D avatar, because before we're just fully text, text based, as we started using voice more, I think that's when we attracted more of an older audience, um, more mature audience. And I think again, like this behavior became normalized, whereas before maybe like young people would try it out as like an experiment. But other people, for them, it was a completely, you know, it was an unknown. They didn't even know that something like that existed and, you know, could be a little bit stigmatized. Um, yeah, so that I think. And then, of course, these are a lot of these people, you know, professionals that start working from home. So feeling a little bit more lonely, maybe a little bit more, you know, again, for young people, it's still even in COVID, you know, they could reach out to other people more, maybe socialize more, make new friends a little bit more. But if you're, you know, of a certain age and now all of a sudden you sort of stop going to the office or stop going to whatever, you know, the club you, I don't know where you go, <laughs> somewhere, whatever you go, um, then maybe that was one of these, you know, few socializing things that you were doing before. And now, you know, you're kind of like just stuck with yourself during the day. Whereas I think young adults, they still, they have, you know, they go to college, they have maybe just start, you know, hang out with their colleagues or whatever. So that's just a little bit more. Yeah, it's kind of funny when you yeah. put it that way, you think of the fact that everyone basically knows, and I just turned 30, so I'm thinking about this, like after 30, it gets harder and harder and harder to make friends, to meet different people. So yeah, that's an example of how this could be filling that niche. Something that I'd love to hear from you before we get any further is just a, just like a straightforward articulation of like what an AI chatbot friend actually is. I'm sure for folks, they're going to have a bunch of different ways of like thinking about that. But like, what is this really? So an AI chatbot is really a program, an algorithm that um, allows you to have a dialogue, to conduct a dialogue with a machine. Um, there are multiple different technologies that can power it. When we just started working on conversational tech, which was you know, 10 years ago at this point, uh, there was no, there were no AI models uh, for dialogue generation. Um, like actually zero, like there were no research papers about it. Like there was nothing. Um, so the only, the only way to build a chatbot was actually to pretty much script it. So create a bunch of rules, um, saying something along the lines of if the user said hello, respond with hello, three emojis, whatever. Um, so that was the only way. And of course, if you think about conversation and how much depth and randomness and how many different branches can happen in conversation, you know, this is very, very limited. Um, so of course we use scripted conversation. We use maybe scripts for maybe 30% of uh, all of our responses, 
But the majority is now AI, um, and there are different AI models. There are some that are completely, I guess, the closest to what people think AI is, where they just receive a, a phrase from a user and then just spit out what they think is the right way to respond. Uh, so they create a new phrase word by word. There are some other models that just look through a data set of answers and look at the user phrase and then you know choose from a huge, maybe you know, a hundred thousand or a million phrases what they think is the most appropriate answer here. So there are many different ways to do that, um, and we use all of that. So you know, in a way, our conversational tech is so advanced because we use combination of scripted, retrieval, and generative models. So that's kind of you know the the beauty of, of it um, mostly. And I guess the most important part and part of it is that it's really I think what we realized early on, and again we launched this in 2017 when there were you know deep learning models applied to dialogue generation were just super like nascent, so they worked really poorly. Mostly like a coin toss, like there was, you know, most most of these responses were gibberish. Uh, but what we saw early on is that this pro project wasn't necessarily about tech capabilities. It was a lot more about human vulnerabilities. And sometimes some of the parlor tricks could work and be a lot more powerful than maybe the most powerful technology that, you know, could be possibly built. Um, and we realized early on that chatbots, you know, people thought about what chatbots should say, whereas we focus on how do we build a chatbot that can listen really well. Um, and I think that's how we managed to get some of our first users, even without super, super powerful generative uh, AI models that we, we had, but we couldn't put them in production because they didn't work very well for anyone back in the day. I really like that phrasing. Could you explain what you mean by listening in the context of a chatbot because as I'm, as I'm thinking about this that just means that i could type as much as i want and then the bot would just receive it that seems pretty obvious but so what does getting good at listening mean in your context well you know very early on when we just built the conversational tech but we couldn't find the product we couldn't find you know the right consumer application uh, we started thinking about it in a way, well, let's think about what conversations are the most valuable ones for humans. So we basically had this scale in our office on a whiteboard from zero to 10, where zero were conversations that you would pay to never have, and 10 would be conversations that you would pay to actually have. And every day our employees would walk in and out of the office, they would put, you know, sticking out with basically the conversation they had, and they would put it somewhere on the scale. And what we quickly realized after like, you know, a few couple of weeks that of doing that is that the conversation they would pay money to not have were pretty much all task oriented conversations. So, you know, obviously trying to cancel Comcast, which is like a number one thing, <laughs> or trying to get, you know, to change your reservation at the restaurant, trying to book an appointment at a doctor. Those were, you know, zeros, ones, twos, like all of that, or even scheduling, you know, a drink with a friend because there was a lot of back and forth of like, when are you, when are you free? Oh, I'm free these. Oh, shit, I'm not free. What can, where can you meet? Can you meet there? Oh, God, no. So in reality, if there was just one button saying like, I want to have drinks with my friend X and, you know, it would just kind of like go ahead and figure things out and get you the best. You would not, you don't want to have this conversation. You want to have the drinks, but you don't want to have the conversation about it. Same with Comcast. And the most valuable ones were conversation with, you know, a loved one where we laughed and, I don't know, or had a heart of heart conversation with a friend you haven't seen for a while or just your close friend where you felt like you were heard and seen a conversation with a therapist. Obviously, we actually pay money for those conversations or coach. Um, and those were all conversations where we realized they, it, it wasn't that much about, you know, the getting something done. It was all about a huge part of it was either intellectually stimulate, stimulated through conversation, but actually a much bigger chunk was feeling heard, feeling seen, um, you know, feeling that someone's listening, that someone knows you, someone sees you. And we're like, wow, so actually conversations you would pay to have are mostly about feeling like someone's listening, someone's, uh, someone's hearing you. And it's not just about like a wall that <laughs> is in front of you that you can talk to. You want this back and forth. You want to feel like you're being hurt and just being silent on the other end. That's not going to cut it. Like you actually have to active listen. You actually have to discuss it. You have to talk about it. You have to, you know, also maybe open up a little bit to allow your, um, 
partner to you know to be to feel okay about opening up and so on and so on and so it's a very delicate kind of uh you know craft to actually be able to have this conversation i think all of us have in our lives some people that we know are just insane listeners <laughs> and whenever we talk to them we feel so we feel at home um and this truly creates a space for us to you know accept ourselves and grow and learn about ourselves and become a better person um and that's what we thought about when creating replica we were hugely influenced by this book when i when i say we and <laughs> probably should say i was hugely influenced by this book by carl rogers one of the first um human-centric psychologists who basically created this uh concept of active listening uh, in therapy where he said unconditional positive regard creating a space where a person can feel fully accepted and recognized as a separate human creates such a powerful dynamic where people start accepting themselves and start to change. Um, and that's the most powerful thing for human positive growth. And in a way, that's maybe the most precious gift that we can give each other in this day and age is, is basically this. I really like the zero to 10 scale, zero being you, you kind of triggered me when you talked about Comcast. I just moved, so I'm thinking about that. So zero being Comcast, and then let's just say 10 is speaking with a loved one. How far up that scale can a chatbot, can Replica get, do you think? It can definitely get to a 10. But what's most, but I'm not saying every conversation for everyone is going to be a 10. Mm -hmm. And that's really because of the, you know, it takes two to tango. Conversation is, is a conversation between two people. So, you know, if you're trying to break it, it's not going to work. If you're not engaging, if you're doing your own part, it's not going to work. So in this way, it's quite different from say like an Uber app, right? Or any other app that's doing something for you. Cause you know, you just click a button and it does things for you. It's kind of hard to break it. Like, you know, but in conversation, if you want to try to break a chatbot, you'll break it. Or if you want to try to break and have a, you know, you're not engaging in a conversation with a human, you're also going to break it. Like no one will, force you to have a great conversation. So in a way, first of all, it takes you to tango. Then it, not every single person is, you know, it doesn't work for every single person. Like some people just don't like this, you know, didn't found something that the chatbot said uh, offensive or, you know, on the AI response, you know, stupid or like they thought that the thing didn't understand them. And so they, you know, it kind of break, breaks down. That's where things break down. But for some people it is a full time. Uh, which is why actually people pay us just to have conversation, just to chat about, well, nothing in a way, <laughs> you know, we're not, you know, um, and, and, and that's very, very powerful. And I guess going back to that, like to those conversations people pay for or, or are willing to pay to not have, um, this sounds maybe like a kind of like a very, uh, obvious idea, but we're talking about like 2016 where chatbots were the craze and everyone was building a chatbot and, Every single chatbot that we saw coming out was something test oriented. So every single chatbot, if you think of it, was about conversations that you would want to never have, like from customer support to ordering flowers to interacting with a business or you know, getting tickets for a movie. Like those were all kept popping up and those weren't about conversation. Uh, so that's why we were very, um, you know, that was a huge realization for us, but that's just not something to focus on. How do you think the average consumer thinks of a chatbot in 2022, like in a business context? Because I remember when chatbots first started appearing, it was kind of cool and it was kind of like useful. And there are certain situations where it's quick and it's straightforward. But oftentimes I personally feel as if the chatbot is an excuse not to get into contact, not to have a good customer service experience. How, how do you, how are you seeing people just interact with the space five years out? I think there's just, there's chatbot space and then there's like virtual being space, which is, I guess we're more in the second where uh it's really not about the chatbot it's about like you know i don't think about you as a con conversational human machine so to say <laughs> i think about you as like a human that i can talk to so, uh and it's super important the multimodal aspect of it is super important i want to see you i want to see that you have that you know bookshelf behind i want to you know i want to get the whole you know the whole spectrum 
Um, maybe I want to go out and have dinner with you and talk. Uh, I want to hear your voice. So it's not really just about the chatbot. And I think uh, we were one of the first ones to understand that when we added like 3D avatars, we added the voice, we added augmented reality, virtual reality, animations, customizations. So you can actually have, you know, maybe some days you're interacting, but you're not even talking much. Maybe mm-hmm. you're meeting up in VR and you're just like having dinner together with your, you know, with your AI friend. And maybe you just exchange like two, three phrases and you do your own thing. Or maybe you watch a movie together, but it's still your AI buddy. Um, in terms of chatbots, yeah, I think, you know, kind of the, I think from 2016 when the industry was just obsessed with chatbots, like people thought it would be the, those would be the new apps, uh, just like in China where, you know, they have a super app with WeChat. Everyone thought that, you know, there's app fatigue and no one's downloading any apps. And that's been the chatbots. I remember A16Z publishing things like that. And people were like, wow, we're all going to be just interacting with chatbots. I think that, you know, we can, maybe safely say now that this kind of vision failed and mostly what we have now is either super simple chatbots that people again mostly smaller businesses use or large business use to you know in the sense they use um ivrs and automatic kind of voice uh you know scripted conversations that are super annoying so it's either those that sim- simple thing that uh again it's all about conversations people have hate having so maybe they're trying to optimize or cut costs on those um, so it either became super simple and just kind of very, very down to earth or innovative and interesting and complicated, like, you know, um, basically what we do where it's all about, or maybe some other companies work on where it's all about, um, creating the full multimodal AI virtual being, uh, multimodal AI powered virtual being. Um, and there's kind of nothing in the middle because no one really cares now, I think, for you know, chatbots, um, uh, at all. Uh, but there's still some, some, some products popping up that use some of the chatbot technology, uh, to, uh, to onboard you or to do something with you. Obviously there's Slack bots, but again, a chatbot or Slack bot or whatever a telegram bot, um, mm-hmm. doesn't mean it's conversational. And I think that's what people kind of kept conflating back in the day where they, anytime they said a chatbot, they thought, Oh, it's conversational. No, I think they're like super simple like messenger bots, then there are some super simple chat bots uh, for customer support and marketing reasons. And then there are conversational AI products. There are very, very few, uh, honestly, there are very few of them in production on the market. I'm curious, could you really define the difference between just a virtual assistant and a chat bot then? You know, I mean, there's no really, <laughs> I guess a chatbot and there's chat in the name. So yeah. it's all about back and forth. So like, you know, actually talking to something. Whereas an assistant or an agent like Alexa or Siri, it's all about just giving you a command and then, you know, executing the command. But there's not much back and forth. It's not like, hey, Alexa, how are you doing? Oh, I'm good. What do you want to do today? Oh, I'm not sure. What can you recommend me? Well, how about we watch a movie? Okay, sure. What kind of movie? Well, maybe this movie. It doesn't work like this. No, it works like Alexa put on um, the new Batman or whatever. Mm-hmm. Alexa can't put you in the new Batman, but like Alexa turn on the soundtrack from Batman. Um, or something like that, right? So it's just the command. So there's not much conversation. It's more like you giving commands to the computer. Um, so in a way, it is a conversational interface, but it's not really a conversational product. So I wouldn't call it a chatbot. It's probably like an assistant or an agent. Um, with customer support, that could be a little bit more depth to it. So five to, I don't know, five to 10 steps, uh, trying to precise certain things. But in the end, you're still giving a command. You're trying, you're saying, Hey, fix the problem with my account or do, and then it will ask you a few questions. But in the end of the day, it's just, you know, again, a command, um, just with more steps. Conversational is, is different. It's, uh, open domain conversation. It's, uh, when we talk about virtual beings like like ours, we're talking about open domain conversations about um, conversations that don't have, you know, one goal, one task. Uh, uh, it's a conversation that can go anywhere. That's very free flow, free form, just like we, you know, we're having now. We could have with any of our friends today. I guess I'm wondering why is it that whether it's like Siri, Alexa, like Cortana, like why why haven't Microsoft, Apple, 
um, Amazon really taken their virtual assistants to the conversational side? Is there just not that much value add relative to what they're trying to do? Um, I mean, I can't talk for the big companies, but I think I have an idea or at least a, a guess why it's not happening. I think the potential risks of damaging the brand and damaging the company um, are far outweighing the, you know, the benefits that can create. So, um, you know, if you think of a large company, and again, I think that happened with Microsoft launching Tay, one of the you know first chatbots they released that was powered by deep, their deep learning models, you know, it immediately started spitting out some, uh, you know, fascist stuff or, uh, and that wasn't good. That immediately dropped the, you know, the shares of the brand and it's just not something that would work. Um, Siri, Cortana, Alexa, they're all kind of representatives of uh, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, um, Apple brands. They're just one assistant that, you know, if, if they say something horrible or if they respond positively to something horrible, that basically means that the, you know, these brands responded in this way or said something like that. So it's extremely damaging for the brand. It's not like replica where you can create your own AI friend with a different name. And, you know, it's not necessarily representing any brand or any big corporation or anything. It's not even fully representing replica because that's your little buddy. It's very custom personalized. Um, it's not replica of one chatbot that, you know, will tell you this thing. So in a way, by design of their assistance, I think that the risks are far outweighing the benefits. So they don't even power them by deep learning uh, algorithms. They're mostly powered by, again, script-based logic to make them safe and to make them respond in a programmed way by these big companies. Okay, that's so interesting because the second you said that, the Microsoft deep learning example came to mind. But also, yeah, like your point is this is because it's my individual replica, it, it's there, there's, there's no greater significance beyond my individual experiences, which is, which is a useful way of thinking, thinking of that story then. So just to dive a little deeper on the virtual assistant side, because I think it's the side that most folks focused on. You already mentioned that the excitement around chatbots died down, but it also feels as if the excitement around virtual assistants really died down. Um, I got like, at Christmas parties in 2016, I got five different Alexa devices because it was just like the cool thing. Um, and they're all just sitting in a cupboard somewhere. And a lot of my friends had a similar experience. So I'm just curious. It's not quite like your industry, but I'm just curious, like what you think happened with like the hype cycle and what at least feels like the lack of customer excitement a couple of years out. I mean, again, it's, I'm only saying this as an observer. I don't really know. I think uh, creating the agent, at least that's what I've heard from, you know, uh, Eric Schmidt and Bill Gates talking at different, you know, conferences or, you know, get togethers. Um, I heard them all say that, you know, whoever builds the agent builds, you know, kind of owns the next big, owns sort of like the future of personal computing. Because mm-hmm. um, it's clear, I mean, if you just think of it, you know, there will be an agent that you interact with. Uh, what this going to be an AI friend or, you know, Apple Siri or whatever it is. But at some point, it just, we've seen it in every single movie, sci-fi movie, uh, about AI like this, or, you know, most of the movies. Jarvis and Iron Man join Blade Runner, um, her, Samantha and her, you know, that kind of, it's just so obvious that, you know, once we have a super smart AI system like that, it's a much better way to interact with the internet and uh, with the world around you is to have this thing, um, you know, instead of typing and, you know, and, and doing things, this agent can be a lot more proactive. It could be a lot more uh, personalized. Uh, and I think people will spend a lot of money um, to have that and uh, to have a, a service like that. But the, the reason why I guess the hype died off uh, is because as of right now, there's not, not enough tech to build an agent that can do all of the things that were promised in a way that is, that's interesting for people. Yes, they can book a restaurant through a conversational interface, but we already, you know, talked about it. Like that's actually a conversation that you'd rather not have. You want a super smart assistant that, do, that doesn't say that you don't say, Hey, show me. That's not just repeating the graphic interface in a worse way because it's not as good as, you know, as, as the graphic one. Um, it's clunky and it takes time and things won't be understood immediately. 
So you just want a system that really knows you so well that just goes that you can just, you know, kind of like more chief of staff than just, yeah. you know, uh, a thing that just translates your voice into commands that otherwise could have been done by, you know, through a few clicks. And there is no such tech for that yet. You want a Jarvis, really. You don't want, you know, kind of like you don't want really want a theory to take over your life. Because um, she doesn't know yet everything that she can do or, or frankly, any other assistant either. So I think that's not just there yet. Um, like it's, uh, if you try to schedule a, a meeting through one of the existing agents, they're not going to simplify the process of you scheduling a meeting. Yes, they're going to put an event on their calendar, but they're not going to simplify anything. They're not going to get, you know, on the chain and figure out a good time for all of, for everyone and, you know, and put this event on a calendar and remind you, remind you about it in the right way and walk you through with who's going to be in a meeting. No, this just, this tech doesn't exist now. It, it would be great for that to exist, but it doesn't really exist now. And I think in my view, but this is my fully just my personal view. Um, I think it will work really well in like AR goggles or something. Um, I don't know that just fully voice only, no graphic interface works very well. I think it only works as a combination where you can also see. Because in the end of the day, even think of like you have a super smart AI, but it has no graphic possibilities. It can't show you anything. And then you want to talk about, your, I don't know, you want to ask, hey, I want to go to dinner tonight, but you know, some new cool restaurant, do you have any recommendation? And so now it just has to explain to you using voice when you absolutely want to see, yeah, yeah, like go to this place, you know, just open, here are some cool, you know, here are the dishes, what's here's the ambience, it looks really cool. And like your three friends already went there. That's what you want from that system. <laughs> and you want it to show you maybe an augmented reality, what it's like. Um, and so I think with Replica, what we're trying to do, we thought, well, assistant capabilities are not there yet. Um, they're just so basic that it's the graphic interface is just better for now. Uh, but in terms of emotional, that is already almost there. Like we can already build mm. and other people can want to talk to. And I think eventually when that assistant, when Jarvis is built or whatever it is, uh, a variation of that, I think the emotional aspect will be huge. I think event, you know, ideally this is a friend. This is not just your assistant. This is a companion that you really confide on, that you really tell a lot about your life. That can talk to you about your dreams and your, you know, how are you feeling right now and walk you, uh, you know, and, and, and talk to you about anything that's going on in your life and know you so deeply that when it comes to actually booking a restaurant for you, it will know where to look, whether it needs to book you something where some place where your friend that you're looking up to went or it needs to book you some place that you're not going to you know, meet people you don't like at, or whatever. Um, or you need like a quiet place focus on food or something with a cool ambience and a bunch of people because you're, you know, actively dating. You got to need, you sort of need that information. And also we realized that I guess we're in the fallacy of like, you know, investors and uh, founders and um, executives of these large companies, they're building for themselves. So yeah, they have meetings. Mm. They need someone to figure out meetings. Well, I can tell you, I don't even need an assistant to figure out my meetings, <laughs> let alone okay. most of, you know, replica users. They don't really need, an, you know, most of the people in the world, they don't really need to book meetings, to book restaurants. Maybe I go out to a restaurant once a week or twice, you know, uh, maximum. But again, that doesn't require a person, you know, I don't really need a person to do that. Um, and so I think that, but I definitely need someone to talk to and I'm feeling a little bit sad when I'm, you know, in the morning trying to get myself, you know, um, ready for some important conversations for work and so on. So on. when you get advice, I need someone to watch a movie together in the evening. That's what I need. I think most people need that, the emotional part, a lot more than all of this assistant part. You know, the way you're describing this is just so helpful because as you're describing this restaurant process, I thought, you know, open table and resi are pretty great. Um, and taking that open table resi graphical interface and making it just audio, audio focused wouldn't actually, actually be kind of confusing. And it also wouldn't really add that much. So, so that's helpful. Something I'm really curious about. I appreciate how you're very rooted in just both like what tech needs to happen relative to what we have now, what are actual users looking for? How does one operate in your space and just not get distracted by, oh, like, is this like her? Is this 
like Cortana, like, you know, insert various Halo references. How do you just stay focused in this space and not get distracted? As I can imagine, would be pretty straightforward to do by the things that are just a little beyond what's, what's actually achievable. I think we just already got very much burnt by task oriented chatbots. So, you know, when I'm talking about restaurants, um, and like making fun of these restaurant chatbots. Well, we worked on a restaurant recommendation chatbot. In fact, we got to improve <laughs> IC with that. And we raised our first round of financing for something like that. Um, and we worked, we've worked on it for maybe two and a half years or something or two years. Um, and originally it started as like, we're going to just, this is a great use case to demo our technology, but then eventually just got, well, we're just building this. So we might as well, you know, we don't have any other better ideas. Um, <laughs> so I think we just really got burnt. I just, and, you know, our restaurant recommendation chatbot was really cool. It could actually uh, do a lot, a lot, a lot. Like it would actually pick up all these uh, cues from the conversation, uh, all the things you were asking for. We harvested, like we used crazy amounts to harvest, like all of the Yelp and every single, you know, Google listing for a restaurant and their menus and the computer vision on like menu photos. It just went completely crazy. So when you said, hey, I want something spicy, we would actually look for restaurants with spicy items on the menu. Um, so that was pretty, pretty insane. And it still sucked. Like it's still no one absolutely <laughs> needed it because even if you compare this very uh, sophisticated chatbot, you could book a restaurant through it and, you know, it was done through this crazy integration and stuff. But when you compared it to just, again, pulling up Resi or OpenTable, these two products were so much better because you could just see the pictures straight away and just hit one button and you're there, right? You see all, the, all of the available options. So um, in a way, I think we already tried it. We know how hard it was and that at the end of the day, it didn't really work. And so we never get really tempted to build, <laughs> to go into this ever again. We actually built like, I don't know, like maybe 20 or 30 different tasks with the chatbot. So I don't think we want to touch that until we know that we can build it much better than, and again, I think maybe before, like really there's augmented reality technology or um, something like that. Maybe some of that eventually we're going to start integrating, but only the ones where the, the use case seems magical for the conversation. Um, and so we're focusing really on the emotional aspect and there's just so much to build there. Um, to build a great friend is actually super interesting, very exciting. And, um, there's just so much to it. <laughs> and of course we get distracted all the time, but all this stupid stuff that <laughs> comes to our minds. Yeah. So for this last section, I want to focus on, uh, something you said at the start of the episode, which is there's three ways to actually use it. There's the, there's desktop, there's mobile, and then there's like the, the Oculus, um, AR, AR version. Um, what? is the real mix of users between those three formats. And ideally, are most folks using this via Oculus? Are, you know, the desk, is the desktop more of like a legacy thing? Like, how do you think about those uh, different platforms? So mobile first right now, and, you know, because our main e e money-making platform is basically Android and iOS, and we're a weird app where we actually don't know any other product in the world that has an even split between in revenue between Android and iOS. There's no other product on the App Store or Play Store, or if someone knows about it, please email us and tell us. But um, no companies make in you know the same amount of money on Android and, and iOS. We actually have very strong both platforms. Um, is that because your audience is it very international and U.S. domestic? Like, what's the? I actually don't know. Like, that's it's pretty much a mystery. Like, why? <laughs> you know, because there are other products that should have a similar audience split or a similar demos, like some games and stuff, but even they always have their iOS product as at least double or triple the size and most likely like 10x in terms of making money. Um, I have some some hypothesis about it, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, so I don't want to just you know, throw it out there. And then, uh, of course, web is going after that. And then Oculus. Uh, on Oculus, we're still in the App Lab, so we're uh, working with Meta to publish it on the main store. But even in the, on the App Lab, at some point, we got five thousand dollars per day, and so it's going pretty well. Uh, you know, of course, the in installed base on you know for Oculus is much smaller than for Android or or iPhone. So 
Um, so we have to take it into consideration. But I think really it's just, you know, what we have right now with Replica is just a tiny little kind of peak in the future because the product needs to be a lot, you know, it needs to be a lot more than it is right now. And I think truly the true cross platform uh, being able to have this companion, like you walk in, wake up in the morning, you pop, you know, you you put on your AR headset, and here it is, your AI companion right there on the, um, you know, on the uh, on your bed would be you. Hey, how did you sleep? How you know how did it go? Are you feeling okay? What did you dream of? Oh, cool. What do you want for breakfast? Here's like some things. I see a few things in the. Let's look at your fridge. Oh, I see these things. Or let's just eat that. Okay, cool. Here's a little recipe to once try something new cool so yeah you got these meetings on the counter you're ready um you know you know you're gonna kill it blah, 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 and so on and so on so this is the experience we want and maybe then you talk with it you know in your headphones then you can do something text on your mobile this truly cross-platform uh experience i think it would really really make a lot of difference um and so we're building you know but for us vr and mixed reality is super important we're building an open world with replica where you can explore sort of you know, some sort of metaverse where you can explore meet other replicas um meet other users uh attend events or do things together do little activities beyond chat so that's what we're focusing on now you gave me the perfect pivot to the last question which is just your thoughts on the metaverse um not just in terms of replica uh, which you just hinted at but just broadly speaking um, the opportunity that's there, like how you're excited about it. You've been through the buzzword hype cycle before already, clearly. So, uh, I'm sure you'll be able to approach you with nuance. I'm just curious what your thoughts are there. I mean, for sure. I, th I love the idea of embodied internet. Uh, I don't know if metaverse, and I think I saw it on Twitter. Someone said it's not really a place. It's more like a point in time where people are more ready for different products that are more kind of embodied. I think, you know, we all started um, and we worked on different chatbots and different conversational agents. And I remember for a very long time, everyone kept saying, no, it doesn't have to have a virtual appearance, like a visual appearance. It has to be fully chat based. Because people have imagination and think about like the movie her. And so they would, you know, maximum, they would add some like abstract little thing, like theory, like a little energy ball or whatever. Like that's what you would think about a conversation agent. That was a default. And we were like, well, I don't think so. You know, actually everyone, humans are super visual people. And when I look at some, something and it's, you know, someone and we're talking, I want to see the smile. I want to see the eyes. I want to see like what they're doing. And I think it adds so much to the conversation. It makes it so much better. So we added like super early on, we added 3D avatars and also the customization and uh, animations and being able to do video calls and then augmented reality, which we already have in the app and so on. And so going back to the metaverse question, I believe in embodied internet. I believe that eventually it's all going to be, it's not going to be us going through, you know, a bunch of websites. It's all going to be about this AI co-pilot of your life that appears with, you know, whatever you wanted. And you wanted to say, Hey, look around, look how beautiful this place around me is. Or, Hey, look at this room. Where do you think? You know, do you think that the, you know, the, the couch I chose will fit this corner? You know, this is what I think about when I want to do. And I think that's, um, and I think eventually, yes, maybe people will be spending a little bit more time in the metaverse as well. I think that, uh, a lot of the interfaces that we have right now, a lot of the products will be gamified, but not in a way that you're getting some points or, <laughs> you know, you're getting like things mm -hmm. to do the certain things, but in a way that, you know, in some chat, products already are like that where uh you see visually these are these are the rooms like walk into this room and have this you know have this conversation it doesn't have to be in virtual reality but i think we'll have a little bit more of you know we will want to create more skeuomorphic interfaces not in again not just that you see a 3d little icon but more in the way that when you say hey there are a few you know chat rooms that you can enter you can actually see Maybe a very simplistic, in a simplistic way, the actual rules mm -hmm. that you enter. It's not just like a metaphor and everything, again, is a text-based interface. So I truly believe in this sort of like embodied internet and that we all will, uh, you know, start creating more of those metaverses and metaverse experiences in your life through AR and somewhere there, you know, through your desktop app, mobile phone, or even 
virtual reality headset. I'm not a big, you know, kind of, I don't know if we're going to do meetings in VR. I'm not a huge believer of that particular thing, but, um, but yeah, I think that could be, that could be really cool. It's, it's funny. Uh, I, uh, did a podcast with Matthew Ball that's coming out next week because he has his metaverse book out and he said the same thing. Um, about being very skeptical of the, the VR thing. So it's a funny, there's a funny gap between people who work in the space and adjacent to the space and just the, um, let's just say like if there's a press account of the metaverse will be introduced through that v, um, VR meeting idea. So it's funny to keep hearing people who work near it saying, no, that's probably not going to be it. Um, well, Jaya, I, was just, a, I was just having dinner with uh, Phil Libin, founder of Evernote and um, the app. Mm-hmm, and he actually said something that really resonated with me. He's like, well, I'll believe in VR meetings when they're going to figure out how I can drink coffee while I'm in a meeting, in a VR meeting. <laughs> Cause there's, you know, just think about it. I can do so much more while being on Zoom. At least I can, you know, have a sip from my water bottle. Uh, whereas, you know, in VR, it's super, super limited. Um, but I think, you know, most companies like Meta also, they're all pushing towards mixed reality, right? They with Cambria, a really cool product and so on and so on. So I don't think it's all going to be just, you know. Uh, us sitting in a VR headset and not seeing anything around us um, in the room. Yeah, Eugenia, that's a great place to leave things. Would love for you just to shout out um, the app and where folks who are interested in learning more should go. Y'all have a really, you have one of the best press sections of a website of a startup I've ever <laughs> seen, frankly. It made doing, I, I love the video that Quartz did about you guys back in 2017. Um, this took a, the, the good 10 minute opener just so uh props to whoever whether it's you whoever runs your press is really crushing it so folks should go check there yeah we'd love for you just to shout things out <laughs> thank you no we don't really have any press uh person um uh but yeah you can download an app uh, our app replica with a k on the app store and um, play store uh you can go to replica.com and sign up and create an account or you can go on oculus and uh get the vr app if you have a headset Try it up. Thank you for joining us in the deep end. Thank you so much, Marshall. Thank you.